All right. Welcome back. This is our last in person class. Uh, so let me ask again. So, again, Monday, a week from today's Passover, we will not be meeting. Wednesday, we'll do class by Zoom. Does anyone have a conflict if we meet earlier at 5 or 5.30? No. Is there a preference between 5 and 5.30? 5.30? Done. Okay. So I will send out um, Zoom uh, information soon. And we will go over one of my old questions, or maybe one, one of the old ones. I'll tell you in advance which one's going to be so you can prepare. Uh, but start thinking about the final now. Again, it's going to be a single question, two hours, a big essay, fact pattern with five sub questions. And I think it will reflect not everything we learned, but a lot of what we learned. Okay. See, you're all two L's and three L's. You don't care about exams anymore, right? I, with the one L's, when I say exam, they start writing everything down fiercely, right? But two L's, they just you guys don't care. You guys are, you guys are pros. This is why if we put con law in the first semester or the first year, it's going to totally change things also. Because I have to do a lot more work. I'm like holding their hands, you know. Anyway. All right. So our topic today is wrapping up the establishment clause. Um, speaking of old things that don't exist anymore, that's what it used to look like. Uh, <laughs> but I want to just bring you back to how this class existed when I taught this only a few years ago. For much of the 20th century, the Establishment Clause sort of existed above other parts of the Constitution, right? It was basically embedded in the Bill of Rights. It was there right next to the Free Exercise Clause. But the courts understood that violating the Establishment Clause was such an evil that you could, in fact, violate free speech rights, or it could violate the free exercise clause rights, in other words, that the establishment clause sort of prevailed, or to use the language of the case, trumped over otherwise. This came up in a number of cases involving public monuments. So, everyone know where this is? Everyone's ever seen it before? This is on the grounds of the Texas Capitol. It's not on the front, it's on the back. It's between the Texas Capitol and the Texas Supreme Court. If you ever go to Austin, you'll see it's right there. And this is a huge monument. I'm about 6'1", so this is almost like seven feet tall. Uh, uh, this huge granite monument of the Ten Commandments. Uh, there's some Hebrew on there. There's some various symbols. It was placed here in the 1960s. It was actually in response to the Ten Commandments movies that were put all over the country. Okay? So Texas had this huge monument on its grounds. Okay? Um, there was another display of the Ten Commandments. This is a little bit harder to see. This is not made out of stone and granite. Instead, it's in a picture frame. And there were two cases decided on the same day in 2005. It was a very weird day at the Supreme Court because Chief Justice Rehnquist was actually about to die. He didn't know that yet, but he would die a few months later. So this was his last actual real big day at the court. There were constitutional challenges brought to the display in Austin and the display in Kentucky. The Texas case was called Van Orden versus Perry. Remember Rick Perry, who was our governor, uh, Van Orden gets Perry. The Kentucky one's called McCreary County uh, versus ACLU. As the X's and checks will reflect, the Supreme Court allowed the Texas monument to stand. It's still there. If you go to Austin, you can still see it. But the court held that the display in McCreary County, Kentucky, could not stand. So how do you reconcile all these? The answer is actually Justice Breyer, okay? Say what you will about Justice Breyer, he really struggled 
with religion issues. He was not some sort of doctrinaire. He wasn't sort of ideologue. He really struggled. And just as Breyer worried what would happen if we went around basically demolishing all these old monuments to religion, he viewed the religion clauses as trying to avoid creating conflict in society, to avoid people uh, of fighting over religion. But for Justice Breyer, what would it mean to have basically a forklift and a demolition truck come over and knock over a monument that's been there for half a century? Right? In sort of hindsight, we've had a lot of monuments knocked over the last couple of years. I don't think Breyer quite anticipated that at the time. But Breyer saw, perhaps correctly, that knocking over monuments is not a good way of sort of managing society. So he cast the deciding vote in the Texas case to let the monument stand. But what about the Kentucky one, right? Why was that perhaps different? Again, I didn't make you read these cases, but you should still be familiar with them because they're discussed in the readings. In the Kentucky case, first off, they were more recent. They were not there for half a century. They were put up there fairly recently. And the history there was actually kind of significant. There were not just one display of the Ten Commandments, there were several. Where earlier displays basically had all these different prayers involving God and different uh, acknowledgments of religion surrounded by the Ten Commandments. And what the court said is, we're going to follow the lemon test, the lemon test. And it's clear here that the purpose, the purpose of this display is to advance religion, right? It's a, it's a, it's a religious purpose. And to do that, the court looked not only at the final display, but they looked at the various displays that came before it. Why is this important? It'll matter for the Kennedy case later. In McCreary County, they said the, 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 each new day is not new, right? We can look what happened yesterday. They said, we know that the people built this, did this to advance religion. And even if the final version, version 3.0, has less religion in it, we will not allow this Ten Commandments display to stand. So in the same day in 2005, the court said, Texas, you can keep your Ten Commandments display. Kentucky, take it down. And the reason why, again, is Justice Breyer. Uh, Justice O'Connor, she didn't know this at the time, I was her last full term on the court. She cast her vote in both cases with the ACLU that was trying to take down the monuments. Justice Kennedy, who at the time was this sort of up and coming swing vote, he cast both his votes in favor of keeping the monuments up. So on the 5 4 court, it was Breyer who swung each way in that way. Okay? Then we'll get the background of the Kentucky case. All right. So while we have this Kentucky case sort of running through, not too far from the Supreme Court, we have Another display in Maryland, in Bladensburg, Maryland. It's actually a very, uh, I get a picture of it. Here it is. It's actually a very sort of strange location. If you ever actually drive there, it's in the middle of a traffic circle. So this is a very nice picture, right? You see from the front. If we look from the back, I have a picture of it somewhere. Uh, where is it? Uh... There it is. So you're looking from the back, it's right next to a check cashing place, right? So it looks really nice, but it's in this very odd location. So even as you have this conflict of the Ten Commandments and the courts are split, whether it stays or it goes, in Maryland, only you know a 20-minute drive from the Supreme Court, we have an actual cross. How do Ten Commandments display a cross? But there's more religious imagery, imagery at play. In the Supreme Court itself, there are a series of carvings along the top of the court. Do you know what symbol they have there? Moses holding a tablet of the Ten Commandments. There are many famous lawgivers there. Throughout the court, there are all these little Roman numerals, one through ten, which all symbolize the Ten Commandments. So maybe you could argue that the Ten Commandments has a place in government buildings because it's a, it's a symbol of law, right? Moses received the law from God. 
this was one of the first laws. They also have Hammurabi's code and Solon's code and, and various famous lawgivers. So maybe the lawgivers is different, right? As a legal symbolism. But what about a cross? At least if you read the Ginsburg descent in American Legion, that's a pretty specific Christian symbol. Or is it? So as you read this case, American Legion, keep in mind the year was decided. It was from 2018. Or was it 19? Uh, I'm sorry, 2019. 2019. This was Justice Kavanaugh's first full term on the court when he replaced Justice Kennedy. Justice Barrett was not yet on the court because Ginsburg was still living, <laughs> as it were, right? So we're in this sort of intermediary Trump court where you have Gorsuch and you have Kavanaugh, but you don't have Barrett yet. And we think about the lemon test. We'll get to Kennedy later in class today. But you could already see in American Legion that the lemon test was on its last squeeze, if you will. So on its last legs. Sorry, the, oh, God, there's so many of the lemon jokes are terrible. Uh, I'll, I'll resist the urge. Okay. What you also see in American Legion is a very fractured court. You always see the very first sentence. Justice Alito announced the judgment of the court and the opinion of the court with respect to parts one, two B, two C, three, four, and opinions in regard to parts two A and two D, which is Chief Justice, blah, blah, blah. That means they don't agree on stuff. Meanwhile, in Coach Kennedy, it was a solid six member majority. There was not a single defection. So, in the span of two or three years for American Legion, the state of free exercise law changed radically. Again, last time I taught this class, completely different. I was like, in fact, if you read the study guide question, one of the questions is, what's the status of the lemon test? That's what it was in the book. And the answer now is long ago abandoned, if you will. All right. Uh, question so far? Yes, sir. In the, in the first case that we read, they had a lot of emphasis on the type of prompt, mm. being a Latin prompt. Yeah. If they had, in Latin being like the dimensions and the height right, right. and stuff, if they had changed what type of prompt it was, would that have changed the case at all? Do you know the crucifix with like a Jesus hanging, like, like, you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, was in Rio? Yeah, the Christ Redeemer, like that? Uh, well, I have this animation, which I'll show you. I'm not actually proud of this one. The, the litigants actually argued that the way to solve this problem is to actually tear the arms off and make it into an obelisk. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Here we go. <laughs> like that. Or, where is it? Uh, so I want to show you. Uh, actually I actually have this anime explosive. Yeah. Uh, that's not that it. Uh, <laughs> is it later on with the, with the arms? Uh, oh, I can't find it. But anyway, the litigants actually said if you just tear down the arms and you just leave it as an obelisk, it'll be better. Uh, which structurally would actually make some sense because you you can't quite tell from the picture. But they have these kind of like um, netting around the side of the thing because the thing's falling apart. It's 100 years old. It's actually in very bad shape. If they actually tried to move it, the entire thing would crumble. You can't move a stone structure. But to your question, I do want to answer it. Would, would, changing, would changing the dimensions of the cross matter? I think it would actually probably make it worse because this specific cross had a symbolism apart from religion. It was a different type of a cross. It would probably lose that secondary meaning, if you will. So I think it actually would make it even worse. Okay. All right, Amy, you want to give me the facts, please, uh, in American Legion versus, and the American Humanist Association, you may not know the humanists, the people that they uh, oppose religion in public spaces. That's, that's what the organization is. Give me the facts, please. So after World War I, they uh, put together this committee. They wanted to commemorate the uh, fallen soldiers um, in the war. And um, they had 49 local men uh, who had died in the war. And so they had kind of put together this design of the cross. Uh, they talked about some of the committee members. There were 10 mothers of deceased soldiers. Mm -hmm. part of them. And they did recognize that they did have non-Christian uh, soldiers who had died as well. And uh, the, the plaque on the cross uh, 
lists all of the deceased soldiers and um, has some other words and things about the uh, you know their dedication mm -hmm. to the park. Good. And I, I found the clip. Let me just play it because he asked me about it. Alito explained, asked that the cross be removed or demolished. It's my favorite. Or at least that the arms be amputated. So, so it was just an obelisk, basically a, a rectangle. I don't think they have any objections because they're religious symbolism. So I guess they could do that. Okay. But, but thank you, Amy. Very good. Um, so you know, we always think of World War I, World War II. After World War I happened, it wasn't called that because you know, there'd be a second one. It's called the Great War. And this was a war like any other since, since perhaps the Civil War, but even more so because the U.S. hadn't really gone overseas to fight wars. We just hadn't done that as a nation. It was the first time the United States had done that. Um, so the people in this town in Maryland decided to build this monument to sort of honor the memory of the people from that community who had lost their lives. All right. Now, Jonathan, why did they choose, or maybe we don't know for sure, but maybe why did they choose the image of the Latin cross for the monument? Um, from my understanding, it was the, uh, the, the graveyards, the field of graves uh, that were predominantly just uh, style of cross. Yeah. Yeah. If you go to Europe, have you ever been to one of these uh, military cemeteries? You didn't? Anna, which one? In Normandy. Oh, beautiful. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a stunning. Is it, was it very moving for you? Yes. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, if you go to some of the fields in Normandy and Flanders and elsewhere, you just see these row after row after row of these plain white Latin crosses. They all look exactly the same um, with, with, the, with, the, with the person's name on it. Um, there are some. We'll get to the stars of David in a minute. But just it's row after row because uh, the casualties from... World War One was just sort of staggering, and it, it seems that the people in this town um, decided that the way to honor their their fallen sons who had lost their lives was to build this cross. Now, at the time, there was no lawsuit brought, uh, no one sort of temporary restraining in order to stop it. In fact, people celebrated it. Um, these sorts of monuments were built across the country. There are lots of different places. And it stood for nearly, you know, 100 years, give or take. Um, but as often happens, uh, people file lawsuits. That's what they do. And they challenge it as a violation of the Establishment Clause. So I think, Anna, you're next. Um, under the Lemon Test, how did the lower court understand this this piece cross. Um, well, they want they needed to see the purpose and the effects of the cross, and so. Um, right, right. So Anna, actually, remind us what are the three prongs of the lemon test? Just, just remind us, please. Um, the okay, so uh, the purpose. Okay, is, is there a secular purpose? That's number one. Good. What's yeah. number two? The entanglement with religion. Entanglement's three. Okay, what's number two? Uh, There's the purpose prong, entanglement prong. The um, effects of the government action. Good, good. Right, so there are three prongs. Thank you very much, Anna. There are three prongs of the lemon test. And it's never clear if you have to look at all three of them or if any one of them can violate the lemon test. The court was never actually clear upon this. Okay? But here, right... We ask, what is the purpose of this? Was the purpose to advance religion? Or was the purpose to adopt a symbol that honored the fallen soldiers? And what is the effect? Does the effect advance religion? Okay. Now, on the effects prong, we haven't done this yet, but it comes up in the class. Something called the reasonable observer slash endorsement test. When I went to law school, this was a big deal. Under the effects prong, there was something called the reasonable observer slash endorsement effect. In other words, if a reasonable observer were to see this display, 
would they see it as an endorsement of religion? So the way to determine if there's a religious effect is to say, okay, what would a reasonable observer think? Be like the torts, right? The reasonable person standard. This is not, you know, the the atheist suing over the monument. It's what a reasonable person would would use. It was ever clear who this reasonable person was. If he was Justice Brennan in, in you know in, in, in disguise, we don't really know. But this is the test we had. But the lower court actually held here is, if a reasonable person were to walk along on the street and say, "Aha, I see a cross," I think. That's an endorsement of religion. And the Fourth Circuit, relying on Lemon and the, and the effects prong, found a violation of the Establishment Clause. Um, the Fourth Circuit distinguished the, the, um, the cross display from the Ten Commandments. Why? Because the Ten Commandments has a law-giving function, right? There's a legal component where it might make sense to have this in the grounds of a state capital. By contrast, a cross is not just religious, it's particular religion, Christianity, and serves a different symbol. By the way, there's this funny line in Breyer's Van Orden concurrence where he said, uh, all the monuments on the grounds of the Texas Capitol are very random. Like there's no, there's no plan. By the way, oh, Breyer, he's doing you know the Pritzker Prizes. It's like the Nobel Prize for Architecture. You wouldn't know this. There's no reason to know this. He's on the jury for the Pritzker Prize. He loves architecture. He just he loves it. So he, he's basically making fun of the eclectic monuments on the on the, on the Texas Capitol grounds. You should go to a Bucky's, you'll get it. It makes much, much more sense. There's a, the Bucky's, you'll get it. All right, so we get to the opinion. Okay, so Adi, what exactly does the court, and by the court, I mean five members of the court, what exactly does the court do with Lemon in this case? And so it's, not, it's not an easy question. They said that the Lemon test doesn't apply to uh, to monuments. Doesn't apply at all? It doesn't apply to monuments that have, I guess you could technically say that have a like historical, or are rooted in our history and tradition. So the courts say it never will apply? I guess. And by court, again, I'm asking five votes. No, they didn't, well, they, they said, like. You're, you're late. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, no, I mean, they didn't say it would, never would apply. They said that, you know, it doesn't, this wouldn't be taken to, this shouldn't be taken to say that something that's unconstitutional. Or, oh, wait, no, that might have been the case. Fine, just because. You're, you, you, okay, you, you're, you're circling the right thing. The majority in this case was very fragile, right? Again, I, don't, I won't bore you with the breakdown of the votes, but Alito wrote the opinion of the court for only certain parts. And if you look at your numerals, this matters part one, two B, 2C, 3, and 4. Those are parts of the opinion that have five votes behind them. Okay? So again, it's parts, room number 1, 2B, 2C, 3, and 4. But parts 2A and 2D only have four votes behind them. At the Supreme Court, four is not a holding. You need five. So whatever appears in parts 2A and 2D only have Alito, Roberts, Breyer, and Kavanaugh. Okay. Hagen could have joined that. She maybe should have in hindsight, but she didn't. Instead, Hagen said, I have an abundance of caution not joining this. She probably should have. That might help her in the long run. She didn't anticipate what happened in 2020, though. All right, so let's walk through each part separately, right? Part one is just the facts. Part 2A is, again, is just Alito, Robert, Breyer, Kavanaugh. And they talk about lemon. And they say, look, lemon is very hard to apply. And the court has simply not applied in a lot of cases. And Breyer loves tradition. In his view, if you've been doing something for a long time, that's good enough reason to keep on doing it. Right, as if tradition itself creates a constitutional right, almost like adverse possession, if you will. Right, if it's been done for a while, keep on trucking. Right, um, and and what what Alito and really Breyer wrote this section, you know, he did said is if if there's this long tradition, this mine has been there for a hundred years. 
how do we deal with lemon? They're practical problems, right? How do you determine the purpose of a monument built 100 and something years ago? Right? We don't know. It's not like that legislative history. The people who did it are all dead, right? And even if a reasonable person in 1920 might have seen religious purpose, this has been there for a long time. The meaning, what an observer, what a reasonable observer sees evolves over time. Perhaps what was once having a very religious symbolism now has come to mean a secular, a non-religious effect, that the meaning is to observe and remember our fallen soldiers. Every year, they have services there for Memorial Day and Veterans Day, right? So what, what, what parts 2A and 2D are saying is, look, we're not getting rid of lemon here. Be very, very clear on that point. We're not getting rid of lemon. All we're saying is that lemon is not a good fit for these sort of long-standing public displays. Again, Adi, you're not wrong to say the getting rid of lemon, right? You're not wrong what you said, but to be precise, what we're saying is it's not a good fit. Lemon can't explain these long-standing public displays of religion. Alita writes, lemon presents daunting problems, daunting problems, right? Whatever that means, that involve ceremonial displays of religion. And they have these six categories, don't even worry memorizing, they don't matter anymore, right? But there are these categories of cases that, that Briar really seem to think mattered, they don't, okay? Then we get to part 2B. Here there are five votes, actually six or seven, depending on count, right? Um, we can't know about mo uh, motivations from decades ago. We just cannot know about this, okay? Unlike McCreary County, right, the one from uh, 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 Kentucky, right, there were lots of statements on the record of what motivated that display. People are very open about why they were putting this display of these various religious texts. By contrast, we just don't know why they built this monument. And as time goes by, the purposes multiply. Even if the original purpose was a religious monument, passage of time obscures that sentiment. The message conveyed may change. And this last part, number four, the fourth point Breyer is very upset about. He says, taking it down would not be neutral, right? Tearing down monuments shows hostility to religion. And, he, and there's this line that came from Breyer, you know, he says, militantly secular regimes have carried out such projects in the past. And for those with the knowledge of history, the image of monuments being taken down is divisive. Again, we see a lot of monuments come down the last couple of years. If you go to Charlottesville, there's an empty pedestal in the town square. It used to be a Robert E. Lee statue, or it's a Jeff Davis statue, right? There are a lot of statues that have been taken down in recent years. Actually, you know what I was actually in Charlottesville on the Unite the Right rally? I was there. Yeah, my co clerk was getting married that week in Charlottesville, and I was staying in downtown Charlottesville. I saw them. They, you will not replace us. No, you will. no, I will not. I promise. I will not replace you. Seriously, I, I was actually there, and I didn't know what was happening. I was like, what are those little lights? What are the, what are they holding tiki torches? What is that? Like, I didn't even know what was going on. I, was, I drove right past it. And then the funniest part was I was in the elevator, and there was a skinhead in the elevator with me. It's just very awkward 30 seconds. <laughs> if only you knew who I was. Uh, anyway, now we get to part 2C. The cross takes on new meaning. Removal will not be a neutral act. And part 2D. Okay. In this part, they try to reconcile all these cases where the court doesn't talk about lemon. So one of them is Marshfield Chambers, right? This was the prayer in the Nebraska legislature. The court didn't even mention the lemon test, right? Town of Greece, they don't talk about the lemon test. In fact, if you ever see, uh, there's a Justice Scalia bobblehead in my office, and I can show it to you later if you want. And it's actually Scalia putting a pencil into the lemon, symbolizing trying to get the lemon test. So it just never really got caught on, right? So the majority opinion, again, is in one sense simple, but another sense sort of opaque. Does it really extend beyond public displays of religion? For sure, if it's been there for a long time, it can stay there. But if there's a new display, it can't. The, the judge and clerk for a joke saying, if it's made of cement, it's fine, right? So if it's something really big and can't be removed, keep it there. If it's something new, you can take it down with a hammer and nail, you can do that. Right? That's the rule. All right, questions in the majority in American Legion?
really significant. I, this case could have gone very differently if Kavanaugh and Roberts had voted differently, but but that's what they did here. Uh, Justice Breyer had a very short concurrence saying, we're not getting rid of Lemon. Lemon's still here. There's no single formula. Every case must be decided unto itself without any sort of predictability for lower court judges. You guys are on your own. Uh, <laughs> and this case would be different. There's evidence they disrespected any faith. Um, and he says, we are not adopting a history of tradition approach. Trust me, we're not adopting it. <laughs> we'll see what happens in a couple of years. Uh, but uh, you can imagine, just take Breyer's frustration. He thought he struck a compromise here, right? He and Kagan thought, okay, look, we, we can avert crisis. Let's join part of this opinion. We'll keep Lemon in the books. Okay, this monument stays here in Maryland. No one really cares about it. But we'll save it for, like, school prayer. They did not anticipate what happened, like, a year later when Justice Ginsburg passed away. They, they didn't see that one coming. Right? Life comes at you fast, as they say. As they're calling for Justice Sotomayor to retire, life comes at you fast. Life tenure means for life. It doesn't mean beyond life, unless you're in the Ninth Circuit. You know, there was actually a judge in the Ninth Circuit named Stephen Reinhardt, and after he died, he cast a vote. Do you know, do you know this? This is actually a case a couple years ago where he was alive at the conference, he cast his vote, and then he died, and they published the opinion with his name on it after he died. And this actually went to the Supreme Court. They said, no, you cannot do that. Life tenure doesn't mean the afterlife, like Beetlejuice. You can't do that. Anyway, so life tenure means life tenure. Okay. So Justice Kavanaugh, he wrote this concurrence, kind of weird. Well, he just writes weird stuff. I don't quite get it. Um, but he's saying, we're not applying lemon. He doesn't say we should have ruled the lemon test, but he says, I really don't like it. I think he's sort of like getting himself psyched up, pumped up to do it in the future, but he's not quite there yet. He's just getting himself ready, kind of like putting his feet in the water. Uh, we have Justice Thomas. <laughs> Thomas, like, get rid of it already. Uh, it doesn't matter. First of all, he says, we don't incorporate the establishment clause that all this stuff is for nonsense. And even if we do, we should eliminate the lemon test. It's long discredited. Um, uh, what would actually Thomas allow? Nick, what would Thomas allow in terms of the, the establishment clause? What's the only thing that he think would violate it? That would violate the establishment clause. Yeah. Basically, um, all that is limited to uh, like separation of power, like if it's federal. Sure, but if the federal government's doing something, what can they not do? Oh, would it be? Um, What's the only thing that the, the government cannot do under the establishment clause? Sure, and maybe what else? He, particular act Thomas thinks will be problematic. Begins with a C. Jacob? Shania? Mm, so close. Not condone. Uh, no. Yeah. Coerce. I'll come back to you. Coercion. For Justice Thomas, the Establishment Clause would only be triggered if there's actual coercion. In other words, you must read this religious text. You must worship our idol. Right? An actual act of coercion. Merely sitting passively on the street and looking at a monument would not be enough. And I think for Justice Thomas, as we'll see in the Kennedy case, listening to a prayer would not be enough. Okay. He says that Lemon is long discredited. It's basically been overruled, and we should just take the next logical step and get rid of it. Um, Gorsuch, likewise, first off, Gorsuch says, where's the injury here? And I made this point last week for Article 3 standing. Usually, usually you have to have an actual concrete injury. Now, there's concrete here, but there's no concrete injury, as it were, right? What's, what's, what's the, it's made that up too, what's the injury? Right, so Gorsuch calls us the offended observer theory of standing. I, I told you, I got in trouble. I called this snowflake standing once. I got a lot of trouble for that one. Um, but basically, this, this hurts my feelings. Usually, you can't get to federal court by having your feelings hurt. That is not sufficient. So Gorsuch would say, let's get rid of offended observer standing. He also says, Get rid of taxpayer standing. Uh, the establishment clause is unique that actually a taxpayer can challenge an expenditure in no other context. You get the federal court through taxpayer standing. State court, you can. There's, there's state court standing for taxpayers, but not in the federal system. Gorsuch says we should get rid of Lemon. It's left us with a mess. No one even tries to defend it. And he would favor the history and tradition approach. But I want to focus on this tradition point. We always say text, history, and tradition. This third 
Trinity, if you will, right? Trinity. Text I get, right? What does the meaning of the text? History. What history came before ratification? But Nick, what does tradition mean? What does tradition add to the equation? <clears throat> What's the difference between history and tradition? Tradition might be something more that is um, widely accepted, whereas history... When? Was... When when did tradition happen? Before or after history? Uh, I guess you could say they have, they're happening concurrently. Um, well, when did the history for original meaning end, in terms of original meaning of the First Amendment? When did it end, more or less? After the First Amendment was ratified. Yeah, the 1790s, right? What kind of tradition are we looking at here? Is it stuff in the 1790s? No. Uh, it's at the time these monuments were. Yeah. Died. Wait a minute. If we're originalists here, and maybe we're not, why should we care what happens in the last hundred years? Shouldn't it what matter be when this document is ratified? What does Gorsuch say? He seems upset on this point. That um, well, like the town of Reese case, they relied on looking at legislative tradition and. Um, but modern tradition, twentieth century tradition, right? Yes. All right. By the way, I just thought of the actual injury. If a piece of concrete falls off the cross and hits you, you have a concrete injury. You're welcome. Okay, that 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 would actually. Be, I just thought that work. It would that 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 would work. That would be a concrete injury. Um, but yeah, but Nick Nick is exactly right. Right. This like, this idea of text, history, and tradition. Why do we care if the mind's been there for hundred years? Does is there, is there really an adverse possession theory of constitutional law that if you've done something for a long time that makes it constitutional? Right? Shouldn't it be when the monument was erected in 1920, was it constitutional? Yes or no? There's an answer to that question. And if it was constitutional in 1920, it's constitutional today. We shouldn't care what happens. But for whatever reason, Justice Kavanaugh in particular loves tradition. In fact, if you look at his Second Amendment opinion on the D.C. Circuit in a case called Heller 2, he's much in tradition. So it's always... Text, history, and tradition. By the way, Bruin, all that tradition. Dobbs, a lot of tradition. Coach Kennedy case, a lot of tradition. So they walk a good originalist walk about original meaning, but it's really the tradition. Everyone's he fit on the roof? Tradition. Tradition. Tradition, right? <laughs> go, go Google it later. Right? Um, watch your password. Monday night homework assignments, watch people on the roof. That's your homework. Right? Uh, you know, class, you can do something good. All right. But they're very big on tradition. And Justice Kenny is, uh, Justice Kenny, same thing. Justice Kavanaugh is like, we really need to focus on tradition. All right. Uh, Ginsburg dissents. And I think she sees the writing of the wall. She knew what was going on here. She, she could perhaps not see her own mortality, but she knew what, what was headed. Uh, Jacob, what's, what's Ginsburg's position in dissent? She thinks that the clause of morality or religion that's because it's off people. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I should have the video, I have the picture somewhere. Uh, where is it? That's not it. So Justice Ginsburg, uh, who, in case you know, she's quite Jewish, um, she was very much upset that this monument elevates Christianity above other faiths. And it's a true fact that many Jewish people served in the Great War. And if you go to the fields in Europe where they're buried, you'll see rows and rows of crosses, but also every now and then a, a Star of David, a Jewish star um, uh, amongst them. And she says, this is an endorsement of religion. She goes back to the endorsement test for the reasonable observer. And she's very much sort of distraught by this. In fact, if you ever go to Arlington Cemetery, you can see Ginsburg's grave, which has a very prominent Jewish star. Um, she's buried there. I think I have a video of it somewhere. Yeah, I should have done this before. Anyway, you get the idea. Okay. All right, questions on American Legion. 
Right, so American Legion is kind of like I call a pit stop case where the court was sort of pivoting its doctrine. It wasn't quite at its final destination yet. That would happen a couple years later. But they were sort of changing course. This was the first big establishment clause case since Justice Kennedy had retired. And it came up. It could have been much different, right? The court could have overruled Lemon on the spot. They did not do it quite there. Our questions on American Legion. I don't know if I'll teach this case next time. I'm not sure how much juice it has, so to speak. But I'm not sure uh, uh, how much salient this has in light of the next case, which is Kennedy v. Bremerton. This was a big one. And it's actually a fitting case to sort of capstone this entire semester because it involves everything. It involves everything. It involves speech, free exercise of religion, and establishment. Yes, sir. When we're looking at the, uh, the American case, should we place more emphasis on the Kavanaugh hearing opinion or? Or, or which one? Yeah, I guess. Kavanaugh or what's my alternative? Kavanaugh or what? So, so for better or worse, Justice Kavanaugh is the median voter on the court. Um, he does this all the time, and he doesn't like when I say this, but I'll say it. His concurrences decide issues that are not present. He does this all the time. And this is a way of signaling, leave me alone about these other things. Let me just put this here now and go away. So when Kavanaugh writes concurrence, you got to treat it very carefully. Because I wasn't sure how to. It seems like you said a lot of good things about the five categories the yeah. test doesn't touch on. Yeah. But I wasn't sure how really relevant that was. If you Post Kennedy v. Bremerton, you mean? Now that the lemon test is gone, I don't know how much, I keep saying juice, how much salience those five items even have, those five categories. I don't even know. But as a general rule, for better or worse, the, the Kavanaugh concurrence is the new Kennedy concurrence in Dobbs and Bruin in American Legion. This is what low court judges read when they don't like the majority opinion. And they say, ah, oh, this is what Justice Kennedy said. So uh, in 2A, the line that says it's the only It's not holding. No. But, but then again, we had the Kennedy Bremerton, which tells us that Lemon's overruled. So it, it doesn't, I don't know how much it matters, which is why I may not even teach this case next year. I don't know. I mean, could one argue that putting tradition in is not, you know, there are people perhaps in this room who have done text history and tradition in their Second Amendment opinions before the Supreme Court did it as well. Mm -hmm. And the idea about that is not so much to undermine originalism, but just buttress and support that it's it's been yes. followed and so it's not and so we have this thing and it's kind of in tension with the rituals but it's to show that this is not some crazy thing that's going to blow up the world and so it's an actually it's a um, it's a positive whereas you are saying why are you looking at something other than the right time period you need to be purist but it's to give comfort mm -hmm. to the idea that we're not going to tear up the entire structure and structure of the law. That's a very fair point uh, from a very sharp mind. Uh, let me go back to Heller, if I may. So in Heller, Scalia was looking at the meaning of the Second Amendment in 1791, but he tiptoed further. He went up to Reconstruction, and he said throughout Reconstruction in the 1860s, there was a consistent meaning of the Second Amendment to include an individual right to bear arms. And then Justice Stevens said, whoa, 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 why are you citing this stuff from the 1860s? Aren't we originals here? And Scalia said, as you noted, that it is a consistent tradition from the founding to the present where you keep doing something, that's evidence that the original meaning didn't shift, that we're being consistent with this longstanding practice, right? Gorsuch, though, I think is making a different point about tradition. He's saying... What the court's saying here is that tradition is not from 1791 till the present. It's we look at whenever the thing was built and start counting there for the tradition. And uh, Justice Barrett had a concurrence in Bruin, another Second Amendment case, which said, what time period are we even looking at? What's the role of tradition? So all that to say is 
the Gorsuch, maybe Barrett wing of the court is not lined up with the Kavanaugh, uh, Alito traditionalist, maybe, wing of the court. They don't agree on this issue. I don't think it makes much of a difference in nine out of every 10 cases. I think, frankly, it doesn't matter. Uh, I really don't think it matters at all. Um, but this is an issue in which originalists like to fight. Um, if you if you care, which you probably don't, Judge Kevin Newsom is a Jesse Eleventh Circuit who had this long tirade against Justice Kavanaugh on this issue. And know what he gets most upset about? Article Three standing. And the courts actually imported a history and tradition test to Article Three standing in this uh, in Spokio and uh, Clapper and some other cases. Uh, oh no, in TransUnion. And like, how do you how can standing be based on tradition? I think Newsom has a point, but there it is. Thank you. What other questions we have? Let's go into the next case, Kennedy v. Bremerton. Um, this is a perfect case to wrap up the semester because it really lumps in everything we've studied this semester. It actually is it's, it's a perfect teaching case. Um, it involves speech. Praying, words, leaving your mouth is speech. It involves the free exercise of religion. And praying is Exercising your faith. It involves establishment. You have a person wearing the color state authority, wearing a coach's uniform for, for public school, praying at the 50 yard line after the game. This is like a perfect storm of constitutional law. Now, we all know how this case turned out, but I'll just give you the flip side. If this exact fact pattern came to the court in the 1970s or 80s, I think you've had a 9-0 decision saying it was unconstitutional to pray. 9-0 saying you cannot pray. 9-0. I think that'd be unanimous, maybe close to it. But in 2022, you have the exact opposite. Not just that it's unconstitutional, but you have to allow the guy to pray. And this really reflects have the courts done something of a 180 on religion? Where for the longest time, the presumption was you need to avoid violating the Establishment Clause, even at the expense of trampling on free speech or exercise rights. And say it's the opposite, right? We used to talk about the play in the joints. Who remembers what the play in the joints was? Play in the joints, yeah. I was the, oh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you're next, actually. Yeah. It's the playing in the joints is when you provide some breathing room so that the yeah. government isn't. Both religion and religion being exercised in exactly. This was from a number of cases where the court said, if you have a conflict between burdening someone's free exercise rights and maybe establishing religion, err on the side of caution. Don't allow the establishment to happen. Tell them to stop praying. Go pray in a locker room. Go pray somewhere else by yourself. Don't have this. But Kennedy flipped it. Okay? So first off, uh, Shania, um, you gave me enough answers. Okay, Kevin, um, I'm going to ask you for the facts, and I'll be more precise. Give me the facts as described by Justice Gorsuch in the majority, because you'll see that Justice Sotomayor in the dissent has a very different conception of it's like they're two different cases. Um, it just it usually in most cases you at least agree on the facts, not this case. And in fact, there's a lot of there was actually, um, I'll make this point briefly, after the case was decided, uh, uh, there was a newspaper editorial in Washington that said that Paul Clement, one of the most important lawyers of our era, lied to the court. They said Kennedy was never actually fired, and they made this entire thing. No, he, he was fired. He, he, he was removed. Uh, but people are vigorously disagreeing on this case. All right, Kevin, give me the facts as relayed by Justice Gorsuch's majority opinion, please. So for a number of chairs... One of the football coaches would lead, uh, would say a prayer on the 50 yard line. Okay, okay. The, let's just dial back a little bit more. Even before the prayers at the 50 yard line, what, what sort of happened in the locker room before? Um, there was motivation to speak to the kids. Yeah. A lot of yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Did did students object to this? Uh, no. So who actually objected to it? Um, 
It was the school district that he worked for. The school district flipped out. Now, uh, let me just pause here. Eric, did you ever play sports? Anyone, did you ever ever play sports? Played sports in high school? Okay. If your coach did something that you didn't like, do you complain about it? We did all the time. No, I didn't. Yeah, why Why didn't you complain about stuff your coach might have done that you didn't like? Yeah, you want your playing time, don't you? Did you ever see, and anyone else can chime in as well, people who sort of complain got their playing time cut? Oh, uh, yeah, actually, yeah. See, who didn't want to run? They got, their, they got cut. So the fact that no one complained doesn't necessarily mean no one objected. And, and I think even putting aside what coercion means, just as a factual matter, the fact that no one complains doesn't mean that no one objected. But the record is silent. And as we all know as good appellate lawyers, if it's not the record, it never happened. Right? Was there any evidence in the record of coercion, Kevin? Uh, not directly. Ooh, you got my magic word. No direct coercion. Right? Um, there's no evidence in the record of direct coercion. This is why building a record is so important. I, I, can't, I can't stress this enough. If you're the school district and you're leading this case, you're going to find a student somewhere, anywhere says, you know what? I felt coerced and I was afraid to rat out my coach because I don't want to get my playing time cut. If you have that statement in the record, this becomes a very different case. This is what we call vehicle problems, right? This is a cert deny case. They wouldn't take this one. They pick someone else. When I say vehicle problems, it means there are factual issues that make this not a good issue to resolve. Of course, I will take another case. Isn't it nice to pick and choose your cases? Wouldn't that be fun? You only get to pick 60 cases a year. They are so underworked. They, seriously, they take the summer off. Like, oh, it's July. Let's stop to sign cases for a few months. Oh, the shadow docket. My God, one census orders are so busy, right? Um, but there's no evidence in the record of coercion. Okay. So if you read the Alito opinion, he says, yes, there's a tradition or this history of uh, Kennedy and his predecessor giving these sort of motivational speeches in the locker room. But then, Jamar, we get this conflict where he starts giving these, uh, or, or at least praying silently on the 50-yard line, looks a bit like that, after the game's concluded. What happens there? What happens like praying on the Yeah, yeah. Is he, is he just sitting by himself? What, what, what's going on there? Well, initially, he starts off and just doing it on his own. He isn't seeing anyone else join him, but then other people are joining with him. So it's kind of like they see him praying, they decide to join him. So even when the school anthem is going on, instead of them singing the school anthem, they're praying in the 50 yard line or something. So there are a lot of people in the picture there, aren't there? So uh, what. This is actually a photograph from Joseph Sotomayor's descent. It, what she didn't note is these are actually players from the opposing team. So the curious parts of this fact pattern is the people praying him with him were not actually his own players. They were from the opposing team who I don't think he could have any control over the playing time. But, I mean, maybe, I, I don't know. But he starts praying, and uh, people come over and pray with him. Um, at a certain point, I'll just be charitable, it becomes a bit of a media sensation. Right? Their camera is surrounding the guy. You can see this in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the case. And um, the school tries to work with him to make accommodations, saying, look, you can pray in the locker room by yourself. You can do this. You can do that. But you can't pray at the 50-yard line in the center of all the attention. Um, he responds with a letter saying, no, uh, I have a free speech right to do this. And I have a free exercise right to do this. Now, Aaron, why was the school so worried? What was the school worried of? I mean, maybe it was causing a disruption because all the people were sort of crowding the field, but what was the concern the school had why they were taking this policy? Um, they were concerned that being a former school district employee myself, <laughs> the school is definitely always worried about itself. They're worried about Damn straight. The, the concern of a violation of the establishment yeah. that ensued and yeah. that there was some uh motion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let me let me just sort of just unpack we just that you're exactly right as a school district employee. They were worried about getting sued by the ACLU or the 
Americans Humanists or some other group, right? They were worried that this would violate the establishment clause. And in particular, this would violate the Lemon Test, right? This is the reasonable observer and endorsement test. Would a reasonable observer who just materializes a thin air and goes to Bremerton, Washington, and says, oh, football field, what's this? Oh, standing, 50-yard line, what's going on? Endorsement of religion, I see it, I'm reasonable, right? They were worried that they would get sued. And a generation ago, that was actually enough. The fear of getting sued for the Establishment Clause violation by one of these groups was enough to justify telling Kennedy, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. If you want to pray, go do this in someone else's time, not on our time. So Julianne, I haven't mentioned this topic yet, but there's discussion of employee governmental speech. So Aaron, you worked as a government employee, right? Who else worked for the government? Anyone else? Can you say, <laughs> can you say whatever you want as a government employee, Jonathan? No. No. Can you go and write an op-ed newspaper saying that my boss is a corrupt, you know, lying scammer? Could you do that? Absolutely not. What would happen to you should you write that op-ed in the newspaper? Fired You've been fired immediately, right? Wait a minute, don't you refer? Can I can I write that op ed that your boss is a, is a liar? True. Assuming it's not defamatory, right? Yeah. Huh. So why is it that a private citizen can do it, but you as a government employee cannot? Well, don't you have a first amendment right just like me? I can say where the hell I want. I got tenure. <laughs> <laughs> Julian? So, um, <laughs> Good. Okay. Good, good, good. So uh, I don't have time to cover it, but as you'll probably come across this in your practice, there's a line of cases called Pickering and Garcetti. It's a line of cases which involves government speech, right? Pickering and Garcetti involve government speech. Now, we've discussed that when you're a teacher and a student, you do not shed your rights at the schoolhouse doors, right? This is the uh, Tinker case. But when you're a government employee, the government can't control your speech, which makes a lot of sense, right? If you're a teacher and you write an op-ed criticizing your school district, that's very bad for cohesion in the workforce, right? There are channels that an employee can use to complain. It's not going to the newspaper. So when you're speaking about your official duties, right, when you're speaking about your official duties, the government can control you. They can fire you and you can't raise the first amendment as a defense. What if you're a government employee and you say, I want to write an op-ed criticizing the president, someone who's not your boss, right? Or you want to write an op-ed about, let's say you work for the federal government and you want to write an op-ed about the school board. Yeah. I think it depends on what, on the government body that you work for, and what its purpose and mission is. You're a Supreme Court justice, right? So when you're speaking about matters of public concern, there's this very complicated balancing test. I don't even go into it now because balancing tests don't really matter, right? Um, it's whatever, right? But when you're speaking, <laughs> this is what they learned. But when you're speaking, I, sh I pick my battles. When you're, when you're speaking on matters of public concern, it's something called the Garcetti-Pickering balancing test. I, I don't have time for it. but in some cases, as Aaron said, there may be a good enough justification to silence. In other cases, or not. In other words, if you're a government employee, you still have some free speech rights when you're talking about matters of public concern. So the question here, uh, who's next? Ryan. Was Coach Kennedy praying to 50-yard line? Was this government speech? Or is this speech in matters of public concern? What, what, were we even, what are we even talking about here? No, I mean, he said it was that personal. Well, I know he line. thought it was personal. I'm thinking objectively, what, what's going on here? Is this gov I'm looking at a guy wearing a uniform, staying on a government property, praying. Is that government speech? No. Well, why not? It seems government he's, speech to me. He's doing it during a time when people were free to basically do whatever they wanted. Oh. Personal time. So if you're on a government football field wearing your government uniform, Surrounded by government students, that's that's off the clock. 
I mean, not making his argument. I mean, the time that he chose to do it was. So if he did it half time, so if he did it half time, it'd be no go. But if he does it after the buzzer sounds, it's okay. I think that's hard. I think that's the case. So, Lane, I'll ask again, is this government speech or private matters of public concern? What, what kind of speech is this? Why, why, why does Gors Gorsuch is very adamant? He says this one's not even a close call. I'm actually not so sure on this one, but Gorsuch thinks it's not even a close call. Why Why is this government speech? I mean, private speech. Doesn't he have to supervise what players are doing after the game? I mean, get them safely on the bus, get them to the locker room. Isn't that part of your duties? So the argument was, in this case, no, because all the other coaches are free to go talk with friends and family. And, and Wasn't he disciplined for not supervising plays after the game? Wasn't that part of his performance evaluation? Well, what was going on there? Nobody else was helping. Oh, so they, they, they made up a duty that applied to him only, is what you're saying. Uh, so, okay, you, you read carefully. Good. Uh, yeah, that, that was buried. So, so look. Arguably, his duties ended after the game finished. Whether that's true or not, we don't know, but that's arguably what happened. We have a record evidence that other people, other coaches would, after the game finished, would check their phones, text their friends, right? They would do whatever. So even though you are on public property, you might still be engaged in private speech. Oh, an example in the headlines. The dean of the Berkeley Law School. You saw this? Good. Um, the dean of the Berkeley Law School was having a dinner at his home with a bunch of students. And a couple students showed up. They brought their own microphone and loudspeaker. And they started giving speech about Israel and Palestine. And the <laughs> dean's wife, who's also a professor, put her arm around the student's neck to grab the microphone. Uh, there's a castle doctrine, but you shouldn't be testing that. Um, and, for, and, the, and Dean Chemerinsky said, the first one does not apply because it's my private home. It's actually not so clear. Because what happens if a state school holds an event at a hotel or a restaurant? Does that put outside the context of the First Amendment? If a politician uses Twitter, which is a private platform, is that not governed by the First Amendment? So the mere fact that you're using government property to give this presentation doesn't resolve the issue. But what Justice Gorsuch focused on a lot is the government didn't craft this message. This was his own message, given his own time. So this is, in his view, speech. And it's a speech on public concern, prayer, right? It's not about official duties. It's about his prayer. All right. So that's the free speech issue. And if you agree that this is... As private speech, then there's a violation of the First Amendment, right? You're telling them you cannot speak. Shut up. Prior restraint. Amy, what about the free exercise clause? How were, at least according to the majority, how were Mr. Kenny's free exercise rights being violated? Um, the level of burden. Um, on the district. Um, hmm? Let's see. What's our case? What's our case to know if free exercise rights are being violated? What's the, 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 the case we talked about last week or two weeks ago? Yeah, what's a good review? What's the case? I'll give you a hint. Scalia wrote it. Come on, you guys. Exam's coming up. No, yeah, I go way back. Even further back. Too far back. Smith. Yeah, Smith. What's Amy? What's Smith? Do you remember? Jonathan, what's Smith? Um, Brian. The no, where the uh, guy couldn't get one of the ZDs been kicked out of the job. Wasn't there? Correct. What was the test under Smith of when strict scrutiny is triggered? If the uh, Thing that the thing that they violated the thing no Julian generally applicable and neutral and or or 
<laughs> Ask Justice Kennedy, it's not clear. Anyway, um, so the standard from Smith is if a law is not generally applicable and not neutral, it triggers strict scrutiny. Okay. And I'll come back to you. Is the district's policy neutral towards religion here? They, it's, it's not. Um, okay, why is it not neutral towards religion? It's not because um, they're allowing other people to do... You're giving me the other one. Okay. You're giving me the, the generally applicable one, right? Why is this not neutral to religion? What, 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 is there any, is there any animus here towards religion? There's no animus Good. religion. But why is it not neutral? Maybe it is neutral to religion because it's not a specific religion. Uh, Jonathan, want to take a step? Uh, prohibiting religious conduct was the district's object? Yes. The express purpose, the object of this policy was to prohibit religion. If you give up there and give a motivational speech of, you know, we need to be strong, we need to be bold, we need to be win, 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 rah, 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 it's fine. But he mentions God. Okay, you can't do that, right? So it's 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 overtly expressing uh, non neutrality towards religion. Now they know in a footnote this is not animus towards religion. They say that. Um, they say they're just trying to avoid liability. Maybe that's right, but they don't find animus like at Lakumi. That was the case that someone else mentioned. Okay, so that's neutrality. Anna, is this policy generally applicable? What does that mean, generally applicable? Generally applicable um, if it prohibits religious conduct while permitting secular conduct. Good, good. And, yeah, no, what secular conduct was per permitted? The other coaches meeting with friends. And doing anything else, correct. There was also this, Adi, this discussion of a bespoke requirement, requirement that only candidates do. What was that bespoke requirement? Requirement. Was it his, uh, like him taking care of him after? Correct. Yeah. So you had this evaluation. I think Layton mentions a few minutes ago. They basically made up a thing. They said, well, after the games, he's not supervising students. It's not clear anyone else had to do this. They basically made up something that only he had to do and said he wasn't doing it. Um, this is how you lose an employment discrimination case, right? Putting aside First Amendment stuff, if you make up a duty for only one employee, you're going to lose a Title VII case, just completely apart from everything else. You can't do this. The entire point of general applicability is you have to have a policy that's written that applies fairly to all of your employees. I think we all agree that's a, that's a good idea. So they 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 basically tried to paper this over. I mean, when I say paper it over, they tried building a paper trail to get this guy in trouble, and you you can't do that because it's obvious. Um, you see this a lot in employment cases where you you know you look at different evaluations. They wait, no one else has this criteria except for you. Uh, but this concept of generally applicable also concerns, concerns exemptions. So in a way, everyone else was exempted from this duty but Mr. Kennedy. And we know from the Fulton case we did last week or two weeks ago, when there are exemptions for some but not for others, that's almost automatic strict scrutiny under the Roberts Court, right? You cannot have exemptions for some but not exemptions for the religious person. So whether you talk about this in general applicability or exemptions, it triggers strict scrutiny. Yes, ma'am. Ooh. So he have his overall responsibility, whereas the others are not. Was he the head coach? I thought he was. For the JV team. For the JV team. Oh, but not for the varsity. He's playing in the game. Yeah, I think the prayers were for the varsity. Okay. But let's assume. Let's assume. Yeah. Hmm. So you kind of have special duties. What you'd have to check in that case, are there other head coaches in the district? Yeah, other head coaches in the district who have that same obligation. Yeah. So I think definitely the head ball coach, as they say, might have had extra obligations. Um, yeah. By the way, funny story. After all this litigation wound down, he was finally reinstated. Do you know how many games he coached? Uno. He coached one game that he resigned. He became a full-time motivational speaker. So after all this, he got to coach one game as the assistant coach, then he resigned.
<laughs> All right. All right. So we have this kind of hybrid situation where there's both free speech and free exercise rights at play. They don't talk about the hybrid rights thing from Smith. Remember Scalia said when speech reinforces religion, it's sort of super scrutiny. They, they just don't even care. It's like Scalia, forget about that, right? Uh, no one ever really latched onto the hybrid rights. Um, what's the standard here? Is it strict scrutiny under the free speech clause? Is it strict scrutiny under the free exercise clause? Is it some sort of governmental speech things? And the court says, I love these sentences. Ultimately, it does not matter which standard we apply. Don't you love that se sentence? It does not matter which standard we apply. The district cannot sustain its burden under any of them. In other words, you lose no matter what, lower court judges, good luck, right? We just are not going to pick a standard. And it's very frustrating as a professor, but that's what we have to deal with. Um, then we get to the establishment clause. And this is the part of the case that when I, when I was reading this, I was like, OMG, because I didn't think they were going to rule Lemon. Like, this wasn't on the sort of the, the playlist for the term, right? Because in 2022, we had Dobbs, we had Bruin, and then we had Kennedy. It was like wham, bam, bam, in that order. It was, it was Bruin, then Dobbs, then Kennedy, if memory, memory serves the, the sequence. And that was an overwhelming week. I was really busy that week. Um, I, I, don't, I don't, I'm sure I slept. I don't remember it. But the, there was a lot that happened in a very short time. Um, but we get to the lemon test. And here again, this is not like a fractured court. Whatever misgivings that Roberts and, Ka and Kavanaugh had in the American Legion case, those go out the window, right? They are ready to overrule lemon. Or do they? Right? So let's, let's get to the part of the opinion that talks about the establishment clause. We know that the trial court and the Ninth Circuit relied on the lemon test. All right, who am I up to next? Uh, Nick, you next? Thank you. So Nick, just let's pretend lemon still is a thing, right? How would you evaluate this case from the lemon test? Where you see a coach praying at the 50-yard line. What would you, how would you sort of analyze that? I would say that the, um, probably the, the third, the third element isn't the one that would, uh, Trigger it. I think that they would say that the purpose could be inhibiting religion by preventing the coach from. No, no, no. Uh, I, you're you're actually answering a different question. You're correctly answering it. My question is this: If you were to see a coach praying to fifty yard line, how would you evaluate that under the lemon test? It would, oh, if the coach did it, it would probably violate the lemon test. Why? Which prong would it trigger? The the first one. Okay, tell me why. Because, um, well, they're saying that the, well, I guess it would be the reverse. I was so funny. I, I know. Said, yeah. You were doing the opposite of what I was asking. I know what you were asking. It would be endorsing or establishing. Correct. Yeah, endorsement. Exactly right. Very good. Thank you, Nick. So if you were the Ninth Circuit judge and you say, look, we have lemon here, this is a effect, right? The effect of this is to advance religion. A reasonable observer watching a guy praying 50 yard line, wearing his coach uniform you know, with his whistle sitting there, right, with his knee on the 50-yard line in government property, that'd be an endorsement for um, But then we get to the sentence. Let me just put this, oh, my God, to be a Supreme Court justice to just do this, right? Uh, just, just here, look at this sentence. If any of you ever write this in an exam, I'm not going to give you a good grade, right? But look, when you're Supreme Court justice, you can do stuff like this, right? Well, the district court and the Ninth Circuit overlooked, however, so is that, however, is that the shortcomings associated with this ambitious, abstract, good alliteration, Neil, ambitious, abstract, and historical approach, a lot of A's, to the Establishment Clause became so, another A, apparent, that this court long ago, long ago, long, long time ago, right in a galaxy far away, long ago abandoned Lemon and its endorsement test offshoot. Whoa. Seriously, I remember reading this. I don't know if you remember this from that summer. I was, I was like, what? Because with Bruin, you kind of knew it was going to happen. With Dobbs, we had a leak of the opinion. We were, I read it already. We knew it was going to happen, right? <laughs> but this was, the, this was the sleeper. 
Because the court could have decided this and just said, you know, this is different from Levy Weissman. This is, we'll get to Levy Weissman in a few minutes, but this is different and we uphold this, you know, lemon test, whatever. They didn't need to do this. But here they were, I say, clearing the brush. They were like, we warned you in American Legion that lemon was in the chopping block. Now we're going to actually chop it. Right. And this is actually what the Roberts Court does a lot, where they'll say in the case, this precedent's on shaky footing. Remember with Janice, you had Harris v. Quinn and a few other cases saying, you know, Abood is on a shaky foundation. You shouldn't rely on it. And then boom, Janice, they knock it out. They'll give you a warning. Roberts likes doing this. He calls it the, actually, Richard Ray calls it the one last chance doctrine. He says, look, we're warning you that this doctrine is on a very shaky foundation. And then boom, there it comes. So they don't overrule it right away. I mean, even with Dobbs, you had June Medical. It's one of their cases that kind of warned you this was coming. And we know about that case, right? So um, Lemon was long ago abandoned. How many years is long ago? Two or three? Four or five? Older than my daughter? Right? How, how old is long ago? Uh, the cases they cite are American Legion, which was 2018, four years earlier. Right? And then Town of Greece versus Galloway is 2014, which is eight, eight years earlier. You guys read Town of Greece. Did that overrule Lemon? Do you remember that? Did I, did I, was that in, maybe an invisible disappearing ink? I, I forgot that part. Uh, or, or American Legion? No, we just covered this five minutes ago. So look, this is the court just doing some hand waving. Gorsuch would have loved to have said, we hereby overrule the Lemon test, stick a pencil, you're done. But he didn't have five votes for that. I don't think the Chief Justice would have done that. I don't think Kaplan would have done that. They like stare decisis, especially because they had just overruled Roe v. Wade like two days earlier. <laughs> they couldn't brook that also killing another president for the 19th century. It, it's the Burger Court. They ruled Roe. They ruled Abood. They ruled Lemon. They ruled Baki. The affirmative action case. It's all in the 70s case they're the acts, not the Warren Court's the Burger Court. Keep attention to that one. right? The, the Warren Court stuff is safe. Griswold is not going anywhere, but they killed Roe. And, and, and all these other cases. Anyway, so long ago abandoned. Look, I mean, we, we can be critics for a minute. This is overruling it. Um, Sotomayor in her dissent says they've ruled Lemon. I think actually Sotomayor is correct. I don't know how you say it was ruled in the American Legion. It wasn't. You have concurrences and pluralities, but you don't have five votes to rule it. But anyway, as of 2022, Lemon is dead. If you are a low court judge and you cite this, you are doing the wrong thing. Um, yeah, this, this was a huge shift. Again, Lemon, I think was unanimous or eight to one or seven to one. It was a, this wasn't even a close case. Same thing for Abood. Abood was, I think, a, a unanimous case also, right? And now the case is no more. So questions on this part. This is a, this is a momentous sentence that sort of turned my entire syllabus upside down. I didn't have this last time I taught this class. It's always different. Who knows what will be next year? Yes. Do you have a prediction on Chevron? On what? Chevron. Chevron. Oh, that's not a First Amendment doctrine. <laughs> I'll tell you later. Oh, Chevron. This little, the gas station? Yeah. Um, uh, I'll get to that one in a bit. Uh, I, I think actually the, the hardest First Amendment one we've done this semester is actually the net choice case. Uh, we, we talked about that one a few weeks ago. Uh, that case is harder than it looks, all I'll say. Um, Gorsuch is correct, though, that the court has ignored Lemon over the last two decades. He cites uh, Espinoza, we also had Cars to be making to that list, uh, American Legion, uh, Trump against Hawaii, that was a travel ban case, Trinity Lutheran, uh, Town of Greece, Hosanna Tabor, uh, Van Orde v. Perry, and other cases. Okay, But note that he doesn't just kill Lemon, he kills the offshoot. No, what's an offshoot? Like you have like a, a vine that kind of branches off. He kills the endorsement test. That was O'Connor's thing. That was O'Connor's way of trying to salvage Lemon, and, and he just kills it. So there we go. So what are we left with? If we don't have the endorsement test, we're left with the coercion test, right? Uh, so let's talk about Levy Weissman for a few minutes. This was the case we talked about last week where you had a Jewish student who objected to a rabbi giving a very bland prayer to graduation, right? This was just like the, the, the Kagan prayer. We just don't talk about anything. Just, oh, Heavenly Father, God, everything, right? There's, there's no JC. There's nothing, no crucifixion. There's nothing that can offend anyone. <laughs> uh, it was just very bland. Um, but Justice Kennedy said, 
that children are different, that children are very susceptible to pressure, and that you can't expect a child to skip his graduation. So you can't basically force him to sit through this prayer. But what Gorsuch said, I think actually Kevin used the correct word earlier, direct coercion. That's you said that, right? You, I'm glad you picked up on that. Gorsuch says coercion must be direct. You cannot have indirect coercion. So the court basically overruled Levy Weissman. They, they didn't say it. That's actually the, the hidden one. I wrote about this at the time in a blog post. This basically overrules Levy Weissman and actually casts in doubt ever since the Board of Education. If merely sitting through a prayer is not direct coercion, I don't see why a public school couldn't have prayer in the classroom and just make it voluntary. It was a pledge of allegiance. You don't have to stand for it. I know people who are trying to bring this challenge. It's actually harder than it looks because of qualified immunity, right? But, but, but I know people actually want to challenge this and to bring prayer back into the classroom. And I'm sure it happens quietly in a lot of districts. They just don't make a big fuss about it. Oh, where's my Navasota guy? He's not here. I, I, I bet it happens in Navasota. Yeah, I think it does. Yeah, yeah, I bet it does. Um, See, so yeah, I remember people live. I remember. Um, Cody, I know where he lives. Um, but there's an active effort, I think, to try to bring prayer back into the classroom. So Gorsuch not only overruled the lemon test, I think he basically sub silentio overruled Levy Weissman. They try and distinguish it, but but the idea of direct coercion is directly at odds with what Justice Kennedy wrote in Levy Weissman. And I think he cast in doubt Stone v. Graham, which is having a tank event display in the wall of the classroom, and Everson. So this is the most volatile area of law right now. And what's significant is that this is a six-member majority. This is not like they, they, they joined in part. All the court's conservatives seem on board here. So I think the only limitation is what kind of cases come up to the court. Um, there are no establishment clause cases in the docket for next year. I think, for the most part, litigants are keeping these things away. In other words, if you're the ACLU, you're not going to be bringing establishment clause cases because you, you don't want to make more bad law, right? I'm serious. If, if you're the ACLU, you stop bringing these cases. So you need to have basically a school district say, okay, we're going to start having prayer in our school, sue us. So that's why the, the qualified immunity comes in. It's basically what school district's willing. So I think we have to have is basically a rich guy indemnify any school district. Like, okay, I'll just cover your costs. And that'll probably be the way to do it. I don't know. Okay. Uh, coercion. Okay. Uh, the school district also argued that having any prayers coercive is a matter of law, that the mere fact that prayer is there makes it coercive. The court says, no, you have to have evidence of direct coercion in the record. All right, questions on the majority opinion by Justice Gorsuch. Again, this says speech, religion, exercise, religion establishes everything in there. It's a jinsu knife, it's got everything. It's like a final exam question if I ever to write one. Uh, it's just, it's like everything is in there. No questions in the majority? Go ahead, please. Yes, ma'am. Gone. History and tradition, that's for everything. For guns, for abortion, for religion. It does everything. It slices and dices, right? Yeah, no, I, I'm serious. It, it, everyone, everyone with the Jinsu knife is, you know what that is? When infomercials, you these things on TV late at night, they would sell these knives and slices, and dices, it, ju Julian Fries, right? Does everything. The court has basically moved towards this history and tradition in the abortion context for substantive due process, for the Second Amendment, for the free exercise clause, and also for the establishment clause. In other words, and again, uh, for the question in the back, I, I respect it, but if you've been doing something for a long time, you can keep doing it. That, that's kind of where the court is. Yeah, Jamar. How far removed can an event be still be considered? I love that question. I love that question so much. So just as, again, this is not a Second Amendment class, but Justice Barrett wrote a concurrence in Bruin a couple years ago. And she's like, wait a minute. We're talking about the Second Amendment. Is the relevant time frame 1791? Is the relevant time frame 1868 when the 14th Amendment was ratified? What's our time frame? In New York, the Sullivan Law that was declared in the Constitution was 100 years old. New York had banned public carry for 100 years. That seems like a tradition to me, right? 100 years? That's a pretty long time. That's about the same length that the cross was up in Maryland. So the, the answer to your question is one that 
even originalists in good faith don't agree on how far removed is something. Um, at least in the context of prayer, though, there's a very long standing tradition of prayer in public places. We have it in the um, uh, the first Congress had the chaplain. Uh, we, we we have prayer in state legislatures going back to the to the founding. Uh, we have prayer in schools. So the Warren Court said you can't do that anymore, right? In other words, if the if a tradition stopped because the Supreme Court said stop it, is that still a tradition, right? Or, or you know the court just just changed direction? Yeah, yeah go ahead. I guess um, if I was going to think of a tradition that is not an American tradition. Oh, interesting. Like what? So like I guess if you're praying at a certain time of the day in a certain mm -hmm. direction. Yeah, I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, like normally every corporate job I work at, that's not a thing that people do. Uh -huh. But if you decided to start doing that, would that be an issue? like you said? I can't have meetings at this time because I have to pray at this time, and that became an issue of their job. How would that work? Would that be a tradition? Well, well, I mean that that's that's a free exercise issue, right? That's an issue, or perhaps a RIFRA issue under a state constitution, whether a, a government substantially burdening uh, workers' religious preferences. I'll give you the flip side. I'm yeah, I'll give you the flip side. Let's say you celebrate the Sabbath on a Saturday, and you're a postal worker, right? Hmm. All right. So generally, if you're a postal worker, you don't deliver mail on Sundays. And let's say you uh, I'll change it, make it easier. Let's say you celebrate the Sabbath on the Sunday, and you don't work on a Sunday. So you become a postal worker, right? That's a good thing. They never deliver mail on the Sunday. But then you have Amazon. Right, and then the post office starts contracting with Amazon, and then you have a a, a, a claim brought by a postal worker who, who says you need to accommodate my religion, and the government says no, we don't do that. It burns our religion too much. Uh, it burns our budget. We have to pay some say over time. And that was, that was a case from uh, uh, about a year ago called Groff versus DeJoy. Actually, a lawyer in Houston named Aaron Street argued that case. That's my class last semester, and, and the court said, oh, you have to accommodate the religion because even if it's a little bit of a burden, it's not a big deal, right? That's a statutory case. The tradition one, though, is let's say the government starts doing some sort of new prayer. You know, uh, I'll take, take your hypo, perhaps. Let's say that instead of having, uh, you know, a coach in Washington, you have another coach who uh, starts praying towards uh, Allah facing Mecca after a football game. I'd like to think the outcome is that exactly the same. I, I don't think it'll be much of a difference. Uh, we have another case from a couple of years ago called, um, what was it got with the beard? Uh, uh, it was an Arkansas case. It was a Muslim inmate who wanted to have a beard in prison of a certain length. And the prison actually said, you can't have a beard because you might hi hide contraband in your beard. Like, it was like a two-inch beard. Um, and, and this was a Relupa case, a Religious Land Use uh, and Slash Persons Act case. And the court said, no, you have to respect the, this other religion. So I don't think it'd come out any different with, with the non-Christian religion. I think the court's actually been pretty good about this, uh, about treating all the religions equally. In fact, Justice Alito loves talking to Jewish people. He, well, he likes my brief on that stuff. Um, uh, and, and you always have these sort of um, uh, non-traditional faith bring these cases. In fact, those are often the, the best cases to litigate because it's not just a bunch of Christians ruling for Christians. They kind of like those cases. Those are nine-os, yeah. Yeah. When it's a woman in hijab, that's a nine-o case. Right, the Abercrombie case from a couple of years ago, where a woman wants to work at Abercrombie or a hijab, she got a 9-0 victory. Yeah, Aaron? Are there any Jewish monuments that everybody's upset about? Yes, actually. I mean, I've, I've, I've litigated some of those issues. Um, believe it or not, in some districts, they actually object to a menorah being put up on Hanukkah. Uh, people object to everything. Uh, um, there's a case called was it Allegheny County versus ACLU from 1989, might be off by a year or two, um, where the court actually said, you can have a menorah, but not a creche, because a menorah is less a religious symbol. I found that because you're kind of offensive, but, but, but that's what the court held, because uh, I guess the, the creche had the baby Jesus in there and the, you know, the little glory to God and those other sorts of messages. Uh, but you do have objections to putting up menorahs in various public places. Um, the Jewish issue actually is something very different. Do you ever know what an Eruv is? E R U V. Is that, what that is Aaron? Uh, right. So on on the on the Jewish Sabbath, one of the prohibitions you cannot carry. You can't carry. What does it actually mean? You can't have a wallet. You can't have keys. You can't put anything on your person that might be carrying. Uh, but there is an exception. There are always exceptions in my faith. Uh, if you're within a boundary, 
right? The phrase is basically a boundary you're allowed to carry. So if you're in your backyard, you can carry. So what Jews do is they basically make an entire neighborhood a backyard. They put this very thin wire called an ERUV, e -R -U -V, on phone cables, on the phone poles around a neighborhood. So it basically creates a boundary. Um, and in most communities, no one cares. You never see it. It's basically this very thin wire on the phone cables. The utility companies put it up there. And it's great. In Houston, there are several areas by the Myerland area and also by the Fondren area. Um, but there's some neighborhoods in New Jersey, I'm not looking at one, but it's New Jersey, who they don't want Jews moving in because they think they'll have lots of kids and not pay property taxes and not go to their public schools. Um, so they actually deny the ability to put up these errors. And there are actually some Relupa cases brought and some RIFRA cases brought and they've been successful. There's, there was one town in New Jersey, it's near Rockland County somewhere, where they actually said, we don't want those people moving in. I'm paraphrasing. It was basically those people. That's what they said. Uh, because they'll have lots of kids and they won't really pay property taxes. And it, it, it's, it's, they're very honest why they don't want our people moving in, uh, but they had to sign a consent decree and they lost a lot of money and fees. So there are cases against, against Jewish um, communities. Uh, we saw Lakumi, which was the Santa Ria faith. People didn't want them, uh, their, their, their exercise of, the, of this animal sacrifice. Another Jewish case, uh, I wonder, uh, you know, Kaparotis? Do you know what this is? So on the Jewish holiday of Rosh Hashanah, it's, it's basically the Jewish New Year. There's a tradition, don't, don't, don't squeam, where you take a chicken and you kind of swing it over your head. And it's this transference of sins. I'm, I'm, I'm grossly summarizing it. But anyway, it's a chicken. Um, I, I, not exactly, but, but close enough for, for class purposes. Um, a couple years ago, I was involved in this case also, uh, there was a poultry group, a group of poultry activists that sued a rabbi right before the holiday began. He was always occupied. He didn't respond. And a district court judge in California, we know about those, right? Those judges in California, they're easy to find, um, entered an ex parte TRO against a rabbi on the eve of the holiday. Basically a default judgment because the rabbi didn't respond to the lawsuit. An ex parte TRO banning this religious exercise. And uh, I, I filed an amicus brief, like three hours notice overnight, um, uh, saying that under Lakumi, you, you can't do this. It's obvious animus. And, and even the California AG didn't want to stop it was a very weird case um uh, the lawyers came in and uh, this judge man he lifted the injunction after sunset at that point the holiday had finished already so it basically was a moot point uh uh yeah, yeah judge andre barati in case you want to know ndca i did yeah that was, that, that, yeah that was me i was the only jew on the line so it, it was actually i was on the oral argument in the parking lot before my service began this this judge and he basically he he waited till after the holiday be, and you can only do it until sundown and he lifts his injunction after sundown so that way you know you can't get reversed that way um, uh, uh, he actually this is actually significant so it's often said with religion you can never you're allowed to question sincerity but you can't tell someone what the what the contents of their faith are right you can say oh you're not being sincere but you have to defer to faith. The rabbi, the, the judge actually said, he thank you, rabbi, he said, can you do the ritual without the chicken? He said that, just do it without the chicken. Why do you get the chicken? Like, you know, just, you know, have communion with that wine. Just, you know, use Coke or something, right? Um, <laughs> Pepsi, that is. Not, 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 God, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, uh, but yeah, so, 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 and there are a lot of issues affecting all different types of faith. And I think generally the courts are receptive. I think, I think he's right. When it's a non-Christian faith, it's a 9-0 case. Those, those are the easier ones to bring. The one with the, the prisoner with the, the beard, I think that was a 9-0 case from Arkansas. I can't remember the name of it. Is there the case? Uh, no, I'll, I'll think it. Okay, what other questions do you have? I want to get to this. Oh, Julian, go ahead. Andre Barati, B-I-R-O-T-T-T-E. I'm sure, I'm sure venue can be found very easily in this court. Um, it, oh, no, I think it was, what's the one? Is L.A., is Orange County in the Northern District or the Middle District? I can't remember. It doesn't matter. I wrote an op -ed. The, the LA Times actually ran my op-ed. I was shocked they ran it. I couldn't believe they did it. I was like, wow. They, they Anyway, um, on this issue. Yeah, this was in 2015 or so. I can't remember what year it was. But yeah, we had to get the chicken. Uh, First Liberty came in, and they, they had to find the chicken. It was, yeah, it was hiring me. They had to find the chicken. It was, I, 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 I was on the calls in Amicus making arguments because I was the only Jew there. <laughs> I was just awesome. I was like, Your Honor, I'm going to speak. And then it's like, Who are you? I'm like, I am Josh. <laughs> anyway, so the Sotomayor dissent 
in uh penny let's go back to our thing um so i think she's actually descriptively correct she says the constitution does not authorize this prayer let alone require in other words we're backwards instead of saying we have to allow mr kenny to pray it should be you can't pray because that's establishing clause violation she's as a matter of doctrine i think she's correct the court abandons that doctrine to be sure but she says the court charts a different path while giving a short thrift to the establishment clause and this came before carson gets making which we studied um uh, i think about a week ago and carson suddenly are dissenting along similar grounds saying what is going on right that for an entire generation, the establishment clause looked a certain way, and it's being radically altered on such a short notice. And you can imagine some whiplash on her part, right? This is just a lot of change. Uh, this would also be Justice Breyer's last term on the court. And I wonder, did he feel duped by American Legion that he struck this bargain with the majority to keep the cross up, right? And he's getting basically burned by this Kennedy case. I, I wonder if, you know, he's a really nice guy. He would never admit it. He's writing a book, which I would have to read, I think. But I, I wonder if he self sort of felt burned by this, that he went along with the majority to keep the, to keep the cross up. Uh, Sutter so makes another point that, that wasn't discussed from the majority is there are other reasons to tell him to stop that are not about religion. There could be a disruption, right? Whenever he came up to the 50-yard line, people stormed the field. They had all these cameras. Anyone... And we went to an SEC law school after games when they storm the field. That's dangerous. People get hurt when those uprights come down. That's actually dangerous. So maybe the maybe the maybe the mistake was they said we are stopping you to avoid an establishment clause violation. What they just said, the reason why we're telling you to stop is we're, this creates too much disorder. This is creating disorder. We don't have security. Uh, we don't want you to create a, an incident in the field. If they had just said that, would this be a different case, or would the court say that's pretextual? Right? Maybe that was just a pretext. That's not the real reason. But I, I wonder, go back to being a, a lawyer, a trial lawyer, which I know nothing about. But if you're a trial lawyer, the justifications you give for your actions matter down the road. And you can imagine if, if a different lawyer from the ACLU said, don't put lemon in your thing, right? That, that can hurt you. But then again, this case began, what, in 2015? That was a very different world. Lemon was still firmly entrenched. Right? In other words, you're litigating today you don't know what the law will be in five or six years hence. So it's very hard to predict. You know, for example, when the Heller case was first brought in district court, O'Connor was still in the court. Right? You don't know who will be on the bench when you litigate a case years later. This case was going forever. Yes, ma'am. Was at all related to Justice O'Connor's decision to attend a oral argument in the earlier case? Which case? I didn't know that. Which case did she attend? Did she attend? Did... I'm, I'm looking it up. She attended. I thought it was. Was she there? But she came to a person to watch a case that they thought they might overlook. Oh. And she sat in the audience. Oh, I didn't know that. I forgot that. I didn't know that. Case, but that was it was really a new woman. She had a reserved seat, and she sat so, on the day. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So O'Connor would. I'm being schooled. O'Connor was there for Heller. I wonder, was it American Legion? If you find that. Yeah. When did she leave public life? I'm trying to remember. I think she left public life around that time where she sort of just, because it's very sad. She has Alzheimer's. Um, she died the last few months. Uh, I told him the story before how her husband basically had dementia and she left the court to take care of him. And then he forgot about her. And it's just, it's just heartbreaking. Uh, just, it, it really, it truly heartbreaking. And she herself later in life withdrew from public life, but I don't know. Yeah, no, no, I, I don't know. I don't know. No, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know if, if the, um, no, I don't, no, I don't, I, I never heard that one. I don't know how much they care about O'Connor. I think Kennedy would have cared about O'Connor, and maybe Breyer would have also, but I'm not sure if the fourth conservatives cared much about that. I wonder, though. Uh, but, but really, the, the, the O'Connor was, the, the endorsement test was really O'Connor's thing. Uh, the case called Lamb's Chapel and a few other cases where she really pushed the, uh, the endorsement test. She thought this would be a way to solve the problem, and you know, I don't know if it did. Are 
are against some of this religious public figure. You alluded to it when you were talking about mm. uh, Justice Ginsburg and her dissent. Yeah. But it's very important. It's not just uh, the idea is that Christianity, uh, the dogmatic Christianity, I'm, I'm not saying this is true, would be taking over and such. So, so, so Jewish people were not pleased with it. Yeah. Traditional Baptists. Yeah. Baptists is one prayer in public, but there are whole groups of Baptists doing committee and they file briefs and yeah. you know, very strict separation, quote, quote. In addition to the, you know, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, and also the Jehovah's Witnesses, who have very strict separationists. Many religious groups are very strict separationists yeah. because they're afraid of this, this really terrible attack, and they still are. Yeah. And it hasn't changed, and they're still writing and concerned. Mm -hmm. So it's a group of yeah. other, other Baptists, other people are fully embracing the idea that. Want to be able to speak in the public sphere, and it, and it depends on who you think the speaker is. Mm -hmm. It all comes down to who you think the speaker is. Very well said. I don't have to teach you. You, you could teach this class. I'm sorry, and you will. <laughs> um, Sotomayor, in her opinion, says today's decision is no victory for religious liberty. She says the court puts us on a perilous path. Enforcing states to entangle, entangle themselves with religion, with all of our rights hanging in the balance. This is, I think, your, the point you just made. She, the Lemon Test, again, was not generated out of hostility to religion. If you read Lemon, Berger is actually very clear. He says, this will preserve religion. It will keep it pure, away from the tentacles of the state. That when the state gets wrapped around its finger by religion, or... Conversely, religion wraps itself around the state. Nothing good happens from it. Uh, the Roberts Court is basically saying, I'm not worried about that. Um, but, but, but it's true. If you go read the amicus briefs filed in, in Kennedy, there are religious groups on both sides. In fact, I'm a minority Jew in many regards, but most Jewish groups oppose prayer at 50-yard lines. In fact, rabbis yell at me saying, what? Josh, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Do you really want a Christian prayer being said? Aren't you going to be offended by it? Am I, oh, whatever, I don't know. Right? Uh, uh, it doesn't bother me. But that, that, that my usual response is, it's not incorporated. I don't care. Right? Uh, uh, they don't like, they really hate that response. But um, they, they don't get that one. But there's a lot of fear by Sotomayor, Kagan, and O'Brien well, was still here at the time, that this would put us down a path towards theocracy. And the fact that the government has to allow Mr. Kennedy to pray, not just that they, they, they should give him the choice, they require to, can have ramifications down the road. Now, now the Gorsuch opinion, I think, is written pretty tightly. I don't think it goes as far as perhaps some might want or fear or hope. But, but Sotomayor, I think, is a fair point. I want to get towards the history and tradition stuff. Um, she actually cites both Dobbs and Bruin, which had been decided a couple days earlier. Uh, I had wondered why they decided Dobbs before Bruin. I'm sorry, Dobbs before Kennedy. I think it was so, so she could cite Dobbs in this one. It, it's very funny at the end of June when these cases come out. They cite, they cross cite cases. The coolest thing ever is they decide two cases on one day, right? More than one case. What happens? They announce in the order of seniority. So Barrett will go first, and then uh, uh, you know uh, Kavanaugh, and so on. So sometimes it'll happen that they will release an opinion that cites a case that had not been issued yet. It's like finding lucky charms, right? It's a cool thing because, like, wait a minute, they're citing a case that will come out in a few minutes. It's a cool thing. By the way, there was another hack years where they figured out they 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 they, they stopped me in this one. So every Supreme Court case is a docket number, right? And they used to be very predictable how they named their PDFs. It'd just be docket number.pdf. So this person decided to just start typing in docket number.pdf on the website whenever they would start putting opinions, and they would post the PDF before the link. So I, would, I was actually able to get opinions a couple of minutes early. They, they, they stopped. I wrote, I wrote about it. They stopped it the next day. <laughs> now that these random file names, they don't let you do that. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Questions on the set of my order descent? But I, I think you, and I mean this sincerely, I think you have the sense of helplessness by Sotomayor and, and Lesser St. Kagan and Breyer. 
they realize that they're getting sort of run over, right? They, 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 they grew up with one set of law and now they're being confronted with a very different set of laws. And the court isn't showing much concern for stare decisis. This was again in the Dobbs decision back to back with Kennedy a couple days apart. And Breyer would retire shortly after his back. He, Jackson had already been confirmed by the time this opinion was decided when these weird things where he stepped down months early, but didn't really step down. Um, but, but the court sort of is moving in this different direction. Um, and the establishment clause, I don't know what the next shoe to drop is. Uh, I don't think they'll overrule Smith. I don't know. I think they've kind of just gerrymandered Smith enough that there's not much left to overrule. And with Lemon gone, it's going to be very hard for religious liberty litigants to lose the Supreme Court. So the biggest challenge is what cases the court even grants. I think they'll just deny a lot of these cases. Okay. So, yes, go ahead. Please. So the court moves into the history and tradition across basically all constitutional um, concerns when they each had their own tests before. Nothing's really announced like we're going to do this to everything, but as they do it, they do it piece by piece and kind of vacate. Yeah. It's like lemon's gone in its history and tradition. So what is linking all of the constitutional concerns together? All right. So you're asking a really good question. Is scrutiny dead? If, if, if you, and again, this is first amendment, I'm not teaching you con law, but I can do a little bit if I have to. If you look at the trilogy, decide when the span of three days of Bruin, Second Amendment, Dobbs, 14th Amendment, uh, uh, Kennedy, Establishment Clause, it's not mentioning scrutiny. It almost doesn't matter. And I think we're seeing the trend with the court saying that this entire idea of this sort of balancing test for scrutiny is out the window. Um, much of First Amendment is, free speech is about balancing tests. We saw the O'Brien test, that's not, that's not gone anywhere. We have this Garcetti Pickering balancing test, which I mentioned earlier, that's not gone anywhere. So you have a lot of these sort of this, these vestiges of the Burger Court where these balancing tests, but the court's moving forward saying, no, we want these bright line rules. And, and I don't know, lower court judges, how much they appreciate uh, balancing tests versus these bright line rules, but I, I tend to think that it creates a challenge when judges have been doing something for a long time. They don't like to change what they've done. Uh, it's it, 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 it's very sort of unsettling because I don't know what my class looks like next year. It's for con law, it was pretty predictable for a while. Now things are sort of moving around. But yeah, I did not I did not see them overruling Lemon and Kenny. That just that that was like the whoa moment of that term, even more than Dobbs and Bruin. Dobbs and Bruin, you know what's gonna happen. There was no surprise there. I, mean, I, was, I, I was still surprised in Dobbs. I thought they would cave, but but I it didn't happen. Okay, what other questions you have? All right, so let me try to summarize up what we had today and we'll get to go home a few minutes, minutes early. Um, when we're talking about the Establishment Clause, I think the the basic test now is history and tradition. We don't look at whether there's a secular purpose. We don't look at whether there is uh, a religious uh, endorsement. We don't have a concern about this entanglement. Even where you have a conflict between speech rights and establishment concern, the speech rights prevail. So the rights of the speaker, the rights of the religious person, prevail over the concerns of the offended observer, to quote Justice Gorsuch. Um, would you still apply the sort of traditional test to public monuments? Probably. So you probably can't build a new cross, but if it's been there for a while, it can probably stay there. All right. All right. Anything else? All right. It's our last in-person class. So it's been good seeing you in person. I'll see you in Zoom next week. Thank you all so much. Oh, oh, please clap as I said. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Yes. Then you will let us know which. I'll email you. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't decided yet. Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you. Oh,